uh, decided to have this session. Uh, as you noticed, 50 years ago when the U.S. Civil Rights Commission hearings were held here in San Antonio, housing was not an issue. We dealt with um, uh, civil rights, uh, administration of justice, employment, education, uh, and, and not housing. Uh, so we, this is one of the, the subjects that we added to this one, so I'm very glad that we're here uh, to um, have a little conversation about that. While we're waiting, and I think this is our angel who got here, who's going to help us. Uh, all of us have power. Yeah, I think we got our AV person. Welcome, sister. Yeah, thank you, sister. Please have a seat. So what I thought I'd do while, we're, while we are still working on that is introduce um, our panelists. Uh, we have a very um, interesting, I think, an important group of people who are going to be presenting, all experts in housing in one way or another, all the way from uh, housing at the federal level and administration of major sums of money to people who work on a daily basis uh, with a community. So it's, I think, a perfect combination to address a very complicated subject. Lourdes Castro Ramirez, who uh, came to San Antonio uh, to serve as president and CEO of the San Antonio Housing Authority. Before that, she had worked in various positions in the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. Lourdes left the San Antonio Housing Authority to join Secretary Julian Castro at HUD in the position of Deputy Secretary for the Public and Indian Housing at HUD. And she is now President of the University Health System. I had the privilege of working with Lourdes for a year as we put together the, um, we carry it with us, the uh, Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force uh, report. We worked on it for a whole year. And it was a joy and a learning experience uh, to sit with Lourdes and have her manage a very diverse group of five people that included a developer, a banker, an architect, and a community person uh, like myself. And with her background uh, in, in housing, but with her heart always in the community. Uh, she made a, a wonderful chair. Jessica Guerrero, furthest to my right, is the proud product of San Antonio Southside. She's an accomplished community organizer and cultural worker. She is also strong, a strong and independent uh, activist who has the pulse of the grassroots community in her heart. I have had the pleasure of working with Jessica for 10, 12 years, and it has been all working in the community. Uh, she, is, she speaks with authority, I believe, because she is rooted in the community. And uh, she is such an incredible organizer that she always wants the people at the table. Today, I think she would have wanted the people at the table here instead of herself, because that's the way that Jessica is. And she does it magnificently in English and in Spanish. Marisol Cortez, another dear, dear friend, is a writer and a community-based scholar. Marisol could be work Dr. Marisol Cortez could be working in any university in this country, I believe. She chooses to be a community scholar and uh, work hand in hand uh, with the people of the city. Right now, she's uh, associated with Urban 15, where she has, among other things, has assisted in creating the Hidden Stories Project. So when you have time, you might Google Hidden Stories. Among things that she has done 
is chronicle the story of the people who have been displaced in the city. We always talk about the displacement, right? But we never ask the question of where do the people go? What happens when people are, are displaced? So she did a study on urban renewal, uh, Vista Verde Urban Renewal, where UTSA is today. And she also did one on urban renewal, uh, where the hemisphere side is now. What was there before and what is there now? Along with her husband, Greg Harmon, who is recording us here, they have an online journal that, again, you can Google. It's called Deceleration, and it is an ongoing online journal that records their, our shared ecological, political, and cultural crisis, writing at the intersection of climate change and social justice, journalistically, academically, and creatively. And that's my friend, Marisol. Sabdi Salazar is a senior at Trinity University. She's majoring in political science and in business administration. At Trinity, she is the director of business operations of the contemporary, of the contemporary, a startup publication of public affairs. And she is also a McNair scholar. And she has research on immigration and on Central American immigrants specifically. And she plans to continue her studies through a graduate program in Latin American studies. I met uh, Sabdi in one of many events that I do. And once in a while, after a presentation or, or a speech, I have some person come all enthusiastic and uh, wanting to know more. So we became friends, and I hope that our association continues for a long time. Um, what I, you know, um, housing is a very complex issue. When we were presenting our report at the B session uh, in September, August. no, August, right, August, uh, I was so conscious when we were sitting with the council members that their constituents probably, uh, if ever, complain about housing to them. You know, I shared that when you go before your council person or, or your senator, uh, you're not you're going to talk about your streets, particularly at city council, your garbage pickup, and so on. You're never going to say I have problems with housing because that's just not something that people think government is responsible for. So there is very little uh, expertise in the community, just the general community, on housing. And I think it is instructive for me to take just a, a few minutes to put our, our conversation in context, maybe a little bit of history of housing in San Antonio specifically. And it really starts with a history of the first public housing project in, in the United States, which was Alessandro Pache Courts, and that was around 1939, I believe. Father Carmelo Tranquesi of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church actually worked with uh, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt to um, call attention to the squalor that people were living in around the Alasan Creek. And they created that public housing project with federal money, of course. Uh, San Antonio um, has also a history uh, touching on housing that is urban renewal. Uh, we had a couple of urban renewal projects, like I already mentioned. One was uh, the destruction of a live, lively, important neighborhood, uh, Vista Verde, north and south, which is where UTSA downtown is today. I, uh, I wrote a book, and I'm selling it downstairs, uh, but one of the sections of my book is called Analysis on the Bus, and it's my chronicling of what I learned after 20 years of traveling on the bus every day for 20 years on Martin Street, first to work and then to school, on how I saw how that neighborhood was impacted by urban renewal. Even if, it, even if the houses weren't torn down there, it destabilized an entire area. Uh, the other urban renewal was the one that happened in Hemisphere, where we displaced a lot of people. At some point, the federal government did get involved uh, in um, housing uh, through um, the Model Cities Project. It was in the 60s. 
uh, we had model cities. Some of us got involved in the model cities project. Not much was done in infrastructure. It was really not a very successful program. But again, it was the federal government trying to dabble in it. Uh, when the war on poverty, Lyndon Johnson war on poverty came, uh, there were uh, efforts in my neighborhood. I was raised blocks from Our Lady of the Lake University at Christ the King Church, where we actually got training as leaders. So you might say that we were working on infrastructure, housing being one of them, but not very much was done. Again, there was no city commitment to housing at all. Uh, it was always with federal funds. Uh, the, the 70s arrived, and we start getting community development block grant money, CDBG. At that time, the COPS organization was uh, already very strong, and they started doing infrastructure because my growing up was growing up in um, uh, flooding, tremendous flooding in our in our city, uh, right here on Picoso Street and West Martin Street. Uh, and uh, again, the uh, the city did not invest city money, our tax money, in housing. However, they did impact housing then the way they impact housing now, through zoning, through the Board of Adjustment, through historic preservation, through code enforcement. So you still influence it, and in many times cause problems, but there is no money to, um, to pay for it. Uh, the, uh, the, so that's kind of a, a little history, and my point there, is that the city of San Antonio has not traditionally spent money, our tax money. And I don't know how many of you probably weren't hearing what our, our speaker at noon uh, said, but she was talking about the reduction of federal money. The way the federal money is today, whatever money is coming in for housing, which we are still getting some, that's going to shrink. That's going to go away. So one of the things that we, one of the recommendations that we had in our task force what it was that the city start investing in housing because the federal government is not going to do it but we as a community are going to have to make it an issue to to demand that that money is uh, is spent okay that's history the other thing I wanted to show you and I hope they're there are just a, just a, a few slides and that's just to place all of us yeah, it's that one yeah. it's, it's encrypted so, yeah, you can't. I can't see it, but we're going to imagine. <laughs> we can't unencrypt it or whatever. We're going to have to imagine. And my point here is the following: We are here commemorating the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission hearings that came to see what was happening with the Mexican American community in the city. The reality is that today, the Latino Mexican American community of San Antonio is the majority. We're the majority. Uh, and it just so happens that if you can imagine a man with Luke 410, imagine it, Luke 410, and when you see where the largest percentage of old housing is, where is it? Inside Luke 410. If you can, okay. Oh, okay. If you can imagine uh, that same inside Luke 410, where the greatest poverty exists, where is it going to be? Inside Loop 410. If you can imagine who lives inside Loop 410, vast majority of people there are people of color, largely Mexican Americans, Latinos. And something that has been happening now, and I'll just kind of venture into it a little bit, maybe it'll come in later, is we are predicted to grow by one million people. All of you have heard that, right? We're, San Antonio is going to grow by one, five mil, 1 million people by 2040. So, okay. Those are my maps. Uh, the, the yellow one there. Yeah. Okay, you get the idea, right? That's poverty. And then the other one is, uh, I think I did pretty good imagining. So. Uh, poverty. And then the other one is called communities of color. Race, ethnicity, again, the darker areas is where the people live in. You, you get it, right? So I have a map there that I call the ICREP map. Because we are, just keep that one there. Because we are growing, the city has to get ready, right? So what, when a city gets to this point, you need density. Instead of growing this way, you start growing up. 
So the plans are for the city to build housing, to build density. So the plan is to do it where? In the inner city. So interestingly, the areas that have been incentivized for housing by city policy happen to be the areas where the people live, where there's the old housing, where communities of color live. So right now, you know, to me, this, this slide and the others show what our predicament is, what our challenge is. How are we going to, uh, to produce the housing that we need to house a million more people? Which, by the way, they will not all be people coming in. They're going to be natural growth, which is where my last two slides are, and then I'm going to let my colleagues here speak. Uh, one of them is, um, well, that's a poverty map again. But there are two slides that have to do with demographics. And that's just to give you a little taste of what our Latino population looks like. Um, okay, we don't have that one. But if you can imagine a map, a graph, that has people over 65 uh, in, you know, at the bottom or at the top, and then children zero to five at the other end, we're gonna have this pyramid where most of our population is young. So the Latino population is young. San Antonio is a young city. So that's kind of a little bit of history, a little bit of demographics, just setting what the, the, the challenge is, how are we going to house people? How are we going to not just house people for the future, but how are we going to address the problems that we have had for generations? That's the lack of housing, the um, um, conditions of housing, and the huge issue of displacement. When a city is growing and their policies being created, what happens to the people? So the first person that I will ask to speak is um, Marisol, Dr. Cortez. And uh, like I said, her expertise is in many things, but one of them is displacement. And she has journeyed with the people of Mission Trails who were the ones that were displaced in 2014, which is the largest displacement of people since urban, since urban renewal. And those were 300 people who were displaced from their mobile home park on the river because of high-end housing that came. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel. And also to, oh, uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Is it a good volume? Should I speak louder? Louder. Louder, louder. okay. And thank you as well to OLU for uh, organizing this conference and to the executive committee that put it all together. It's really impressive, and I'm really honored to be here with you. Um, as Maria mentioned, my name is Marisol, and I am a creative writer and a community scholar, primarily um, based here in San Antonio. I, I did my PhD in cultural studies from the University of California, Davis, but I choose to work in the community um, instead of in the university supporting social movement building primarily through writing and research. And with Maria, who I've known for many years, with Jessica, who I've known for many years, and many others, I have participated in numerous struggles, um, mostly around land and water protection, struggles to protect la madre tierra against predatory and extractive forms of development, and to create and preserve the commons. And so that's kind of the lens that I bring to thinking about housing that I wanted to share with you today. Um, today what I wanted to do is present some kind of bigger picture ways of thinking about housing from that perspective. But before I do, um, what I would like to do is open with a poem that I wrote as I was doing kind of the more scholarly writing um, about what happened at Mission Trails. And in part because I think the numbers that came out of that research are very important. But I think um, in the face of uh, institutional forces of erasure, some stories can really only be documented um, poetically or creatively. So um, I'll open with a poem that is called Dedication to the Ones Who Stayed Until the End. The ones who stayed till the end 
did not want to go to any parks on any developer's approved list. The ones who stayed till the end did not want to post to Craigslist $5,000 homes into which they had poured 15000 in repairs inside which they rebuilt lives once wrecked by violence, domestic or state or both. The ones who stayed all the way until the end did so because they saw what happened to their neighbors when their neighbors left on someone else's terms, someone else's timeline, someone else's I know what's best someone else's for your own good, for the good of the city, for the good of the tax base, and they said, no, sorry, not good enough. The ones who stayed believed in the rightness and the goodness of what they wanted and what their children deserved. They wouldn't settle. They dreamed of keeping their homes or buying a home, of buying land where they could move together in this land where rights are founded on removal. The ones who stayed until the end were the bravest because they had no choice. There was nothing, no help for women without papers, women without English, who were mothers of young children. The ones who could left early, before the rats came, the break-ins, the machines chewing up, the empty trailers with mouths gaping, not even stopping when the kids walked past on their way home from school. The ones with the least had no choice but to stay in furious tones naming the raw deal they'd gotten and how it wasn't enough. In the end, what they got was near, nothing near what they needed, but they never stopped insisting on their right to it. They fought and stayed till the end, abandoned and failed in the end by the city, the developers, the organizations, even the lawyer, even us, everyone supposedly trying to help, confounded by these women who refused to take the deal and get out. Didn't they understand what a good deal they were getting? Weren't they grateful? Didn't they know they were entitled to nothing? These mujeres desagradecidas were not about to leave before they were ready or to move where they didn't want to go to begin with. The ones who stayed till the end were non-persons in the eyes of the state with no rights to land or even survival, much less any pursuit of happiness, which was why they insisted in the name of their full humanity that, in fact, they deserve the world for what had been done to them and to their children. So that one was one of several that came out um, as I was working with the Sinos the Mission Trails with Jessica and some other folks to support resident organizing at Mission Trails Mobile Home Community by documenting what had happened there. And the report that we produced, um, try and you can, if you go online to this URL, you can you can get to that report and download it for yourself. But the report that we tried to produce um, wanted to place the story of Mission Trails into the broader historical context of both neoliberal forms of urban governance as well as San Antonio's deep history of colonialism. We used archival documents to piece together how and why the city made its decision to rezone the, the mobile home park. And most importantly, we tried to make visible the impacts of displacement, interviewing 51 families, which was about um, approximately half of those who were removed from their homes. For us, it was a project of witness. To remember and write down what happened and how it affected people was to refuse the city and the developers' preference that it be forgotten or erased or denied. Because the irony of displacement is that when you push people out of a space they've been living, what you're also erasing is evidence that it happened. So we wanted to make sure that that did not happen. Some of the things we learned from doing the interviews, which we wouldn't have known otherwise, included um, first that three residents died after displacement. Two of them were elders. Uh, one of them was a man who died by suicide. This is one of the elders who passed about six months after she was removed from her home. Um, about one in five residents experienced a period of homelessness after removal, in the longest case for about um, 18 months, a year and a half. And these are two little girls, um, these are two of the children that were uh, homeless for a year and a half um, on the eve before they, they left Mission Trails. Um, and then another kind of severe impact was that even if folks weren't homeless, there was a rise in housing insecurity. For many others, about two out of five households that we interviewed had moved more than once by the time we interviewed them. So it wasn't just that they
they were they were displaced once. It was it sort of unleashed this chain of removals and and, um, and relocations. About one in five residents that we spoke with interviewed uh, experienced life-threatening health impacts requiring hospitalization as a result of the stress of new zoning and displacement. And about three out of five reported mental health impacts specifically. Over half of the households that we interviewed reported negative impacts on their children. And one in five of those households reported impacts, um, health impacts on their children, primarily depression and anxiety. Uh, at the time, when people were living at Mission Trails, about half of them were already housing burdened, meaning they paid more than 30% of their, um, their income on either rent or mortgage plus utilities. But after they were displaced, that number rose to 71% of people. Um, and you know, the reason was because many had, many own their homes, they had to leave their homes behind, their, you know, they lost their home, and they became renters after being owners. And then lastly, um, about three out of four households that we talked to reported negative impacts on social networks and sense of community, which doesn't sound as severe as some of the other impacts, but um, I mean, in the case of the, one of the elders who passed, um, it was because of the, a primary factor was the deterioration of the social network she had relied on to keep her safe um, because she was living in a situation where her housemate was abusive um, and when she moved away from um, an adopted daughter who had kind of always protected her, that's what that's what happened. We, she, her adopted daughter feels that that had a role in in her death and that abuse. Um, so that is those numbers are important, and we wouldn't know those numbers without talking to people. But what I actually wanted to talk about today was this the deeper significance of this case and the deeper issues at stake when we talk about gentrification. Um, and kind of the fuller development of, of these ideas come from um, a chapter that I did for uh, a book that Rudy Rosales edited that just came out called Community as the Material Basis of Citizenship. So the chapter is based on the work that we did at Mission Trails, but it's sort of a more kind of um, thinking about these the bigger picture ideas of it. Um, we often conceptualize gentrification as a housing rights struggle only, and it is that, but at root it is a struggle of the most dispossessed communities to claim a right to the city, a right to say what happens to the land that they live on, in a legal context where land is seen only as a commodity to be bought and sold at profit, and where only landowners have a say in what happens to it. So while mission trails might seem like an extreme example of development politics in San Antonio, I would argue it's simply the most egregiously visible tip of an iceberg that is the deeper logic at work in all struggles over development, both here in San Antonio and around the world. What was most striking about the case of Mission Trails for those who lived and witnessed it is true in a more general sense, whether we're talking about struggles over the Hay Street Bridge, or we're talking about Vista Ridge, the, the pipeline, or we're talking about the South Texas Nuclear Project, or we're talking about PGA from so many years ago, uh, or we're talking about the present effort to develop a climate action plan that's based on social justice. Not only did Mission Trails residents have no right to remain in their homes, more fundamentally, they had no rights to participate meaningfully in decisions about the place that they lived, even when those decisions would threaten their lives. While superficially they might have had a right to address elected officials, their interests and input were of no material consequence. And this was true for those whose legal status was curtailed, um, uh, for, for those whose legal status curtailed their rights to participation. But it was also true of all Mission Trails residents, regardless of legal status. And it was true, too, for the broader community of San Antonio residents supporting resident organizing at Mission Trails. None of us have the right to participate meaningfully in such a critical decision about the place we call home. And that's really what we mean when, if you hear, if you hear people talk about neoliberal urbanism or neoliberal urban governance, and that's really the root issue. Thinking about gentrification in these terms, however, I think we arrive at the other striking thing about Mission Trails, which is why I wanted to open with that particular poem. And that is residents' fierce insistence on claiming rights that they did not have. Rights that the system of legal citizenship 
and neoliberal urban governance are in fact set up to deny. In fighting for their homes, they embodied, these residents embodied and therefore called forth, they invoked an alternate vision of political belonging rooted not in citizenship or property ownership, but in residence, in inhabitants, in a relationship to land outside of commodification, a relationship to the political body beyond exclusionary forms of citizenship. So I want to end by just taking a little time to try to put into words what this embodiment means for all of our ongoing efforts to protect and build the commons in the face of these parasitic forms of development. Native scholar Daniel R. Wildcat, who is a, a Uchi Creek professor at Haskell Indian Nations University, has argued for the need to understand space or land less as an abstraction and instead as particular home places or what he calls nature culture nexuses. So in other words, every place grounds particular interactions between its human and its non-human residents. So the right to the city is not simply the right to participate in decisions about what happens to the places we inhabit, or the right to create cities that meet the needs of the most vulnerable, it is that. But it also depends more deeply on reconceptualizing urban space as land, and reconceptualizing land as nature that itself has a right to be healthy undisrupted and free of commodification. This is where the right to the city intersects with movements to recognize the rights of nature, or derechos de la madre tierra, as in the recent constitutional revisions in Ecuador to include a universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth. It also points to the global south, to indigenous-led movements throughout Latin America for Buen Vivir a model of social and ecological wellness that stands as an alternative to development. Buen vivir is, is a mestizo term, so it's a translation into Spanish from concepts originally part of indigenous cosmovisions. Most frequently, catch the Quechua idea of sumac cause, meaning a fullness of life in a community together with other persons and with nature. As a paradigm, Buen vivir rejects several key assumptions of modernity that undergird the idea of development. First is that the single highest goal of all societies is development, epitomized by the living conditions of the global north. When you may rejects the idea that progress toward this goal is linear, and that the best expression of this progress is economic growth as measured by GDP. Most importantly, when you may rejects the idea, which is foundational to Western thought, that humans are outside of and above nature that humans are subjects over an object to be controlled and manipulated in this linear process of things getting better and better. From its first articulation in the post-war United States, modern Western nations have not stopped seeking to impose development on the rest of the world as a supreme social aspiration, including among the poor within their own cities, and that's the idea of economic development. Whatever internal contradictions or unintended consequences arise from this paradigm, we attach prefixes to soften the edges, right? We call it sustainable development, or we call it human development, or equitable development. But the core logic of this paradigm remains. According to the, um, the Ecuadorian scholar Eduardo Bulinas, development is, a, he calls it a zombie category. We slay it, and it returns. So even as it's declared defunct, he writes, in its next step, it is promoted as the only way forward. How many times do we go to the zoning commission or the city council and feel like we have to say, it's not that I'm against development, but before talking about all of the ways that a particular project inherently threatens access to housing or clean water or air or even our lives. When we read, however, breaks from development entirely as a paradigm and one of the primary ways it does so is by rejecting the idea, that idea that nature is an object to be controlled or mastered in the interest of progress. Ecuador's Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, for instance, defines the Earth as, quote, a self-regulating community of interrelated beings that sustains, contains, and re reproduces all beings, and which as such possesses inalienable rights to continue its vital cycles and processes free from human disruptions. So the earth, too, has a right to remain. Wendy Reed then abolishes the nature-culture dualism that feminist philosopher Val Plumwood 
as argued, is central to Western ways of knowing and being in the world, and which Alberto Acosta argues is also at the root of colonization within the Americas and Africa. By contrast, when we read Paz, it's not only a way of knowing and being, but also a political body, a polity, in which nature has agency and political subjectivity. To be fully realizable then, the right to the city, the right to inhabit our home place as well, must be grounded in a more primary ascription of rights to nature itself, to be free from commodification. Like the communities of the South, we are done with development as a model of well-being. We who call this place home, who stood with the ones who stayed at mission trails until the end, who tracked their dispersal across the city, the state, the nation, indeed the continent after their removal, and who insist on a right to remain and to migration both, know that place is important because it is polity. To paraphrase Tony Rasham Samara, our power resides in our connection to the places where we belong. And the strength of that connection derives from our knowledge that the earth itself, the river on whose banks mission trail sat, is alive and cannot be owned. It has its own rights to be healthy and to thrive. Everyone, I'm uh, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, and uh, first I want to um, also echo uh, Marisol's um, uh, comments, thanking Maria Berriozabal for inviting us to be part of um, today's uh, discussion about housing, affordable housing, neighborhoods, and really the importance um, of uh, working together to ensure that everyone has a place to call home. Um, as Maria uh, Bediosabal mentioned, um, I um, had um, the, really the, the honor of serving as the chair of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. Uh, this was a task force that was created uh, last August of 2017 by uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg. And you know, I think that as I was reflecting on like, what prompted the mayor to create um, you know, to create this task force, I was thinking about some of Maria's comments um, regarding um, population. Our, our city is growing, right? Um, by 2040, as Maria mentioned, we will have a million new people um, moving in to San Antonio or being born um, in, in San Antonio. Uh, the other thing that I think, you know, triggered um, this um, really uh, interest in beginning to better understand housing was Mission Trails. And so as Dr. Cortez pointed out, uh, this was probably the first time in recent history in San Antonio where um, we didn't know what was happening. Uh, we, uh, at the city sort of government level, didn't uh, acknowledge that people were um, being impacted um, didn't know how to deal with it, um, and yet um, the, the faces, the experience, the reality, as, as Dr. You know, Cortez pointed out, are very clear, that these were families that were living in this community that may not have had the financial means or wherewithal, uh, and did their best to organize and you know, to have a voice, and we, when I say we, I, I mean we, the sort of collective we, um, city council, because this is, again, you know, sort of the impetus for why, why create a mayor's housing policy t task force. I don't think we dealt with this, you know, correctly. I don't think we understood it. I think it goes back to a point also that Maria made that housing is very a very complex issue, and yet it's not. Because I think when we uh, think about housing, I think we think about housing as an individual issue an individual problem. And we don't think about it as housing is part of our collective community responsibility. And there are forces at play that put pressures on families, and those forces at play that put pressures on their uh, families um, are uh, created um, not necessarily by individual families, but by the fact that we don't um, uh, really sort of dive in deep into understanding the socioeconomic um, priorities that we have as a city. 
So in August of 2017, Mayor uh, Ron Nuremberg created the task force with kind of a very simple singular charge, which, which was to create a comprehensive and compassionate housing policy, um, a framework to guide the city's uh, focus on uh, housing, um, but not just from a data perspective, but also to better understand the reality that families were facing um, at, at a human perspective. And so if you can uh, fast forward. And so these were our conclusions. I, you know, I'm going to walk you through the process and some key data, but I think it's really important that we not lose sight of what we found, which you know, sort of built on, um, on the fact that San Antonio, like many other cities, is having an affordability crisis. And um, housing affordability is impacting neighborhoods across the city. And when we don't have access to affordable housing, it affects housing stability, family stability, student success. It also affects our health. And it does affect the economic prosperity of a city. What we also found is that this housing affordability and insecurity issue is having a disproportional impact on low-income individuals and households. And um, you know, we saw the map earlier, and we saw sort of the the areas um, of our city that have been maybe not as um, where we have not provided the level of infrastructure support, where we still have deep you know, pockets of poverty. So um, as a result, we also saw that Latinos are disproportionately more impacted by housing affordability and insecurity issues. Finally, you know, what we um, saw uh, very clearly was that housing has not been a priority in San Antonio. It has, you know, it has not been um, something that we have been able to understand and rally behind and sort of commit to a set of policies and dedicate resources and implement. You know, it's, it's also um, something that I think as a country we've struggled with, right? Uh, in 1968, um, 50 years ago, um, the, housing fair, uh, the Fair Housing Act was passed. Uh, and this was just a focus on uh, basically non-discrimination uh, based on race, religion, uh, gender, um, and you know, uh, nationality as it relates to the sale, rental, uh, and access to housing. And so, you know, um, Maria mentioned earlier that as we go back 50 years, housing maybe was not as you know critical of a uh, was maybe not sort of on the agenda here locally the way that maybe education was, but housing has been a struggle, I think, you know, for the last 50 years. And it was very clear to us that in San Antonio we have not been able to, uh, to really um, make housing uh, central to the conversation that we're having. And we have not really um, acknowledged that housing is part of the infrastructure of our city. As one of our colleagues said, you know, housing is the fourth pillar of our economic infrastructure. Just like water, just like energy, just like transportation, we need to focus on housing. And when we don't focus on housing, when we don't focus on affordable housing, when we know that you know, there is also this history of disinvestment, a history of redlining, a history of discrimination, then uh, we end up also with um, vulnerable populations being disproportionately more um, impacted. So those were the findings um, in a very sort of succinct way in terms of what the Mayor's Housing Policy um, Task Force uh, has captured in the report that we produced. And, and you know, these are just sort of images. This is context for everybody. This is not happening just here in San Antonio. It's happening across the country. Housing affordability, whether housing is a right or not, um, homelessness, housing insecurity. This is happening across the country. And San Antonio, I think, and I think we collectively in our um, report also um, 
put forward this um, recommendation that while we do have a housing um, crisis here in San Antonio, it is not as severe as certain other cities. And we have an opportunity to intervene. We have an opportunity to be proactive. We have an opportunity to be thoughtful. And we have an opportunity to put together a set of policies that will help guide the uh, future um, development of our city at, when it comes to housing, rental housing, homeownership housing, and other types of housing options. So what the task force um, accomplished in about a year, collectively and together with many people, was to uh, build or develop a comprehensive plan uh, for an equitable housing system. That's how I view it. Um, you know, I went back and re read the report, uh, and that this is exactly what we produced. It was a bottom-up process that led to the creation of this report and set of recommendations. It was community-led. It was also data-driven. Uh, we wanted to understand the history, the data, the uh, best practices, uh, and to analyze you know, what had been done maybe in the past to inform our recommendations. It was also a very inclusive community process. Early on in the development of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, we adopted a set of values as a task force that were really grounded in ensuring, um, in many ways, and really creating a different way of developing policy. We focus on transparency and accountability. Accountability, you know, meaning to each other, but also to the people that were part of this process. Uh, we um, also were committed to listening and understanding the community experience. It was not just our experience or our perspective, it was really trying to understand what is happening on the ground how do we sort of elevate those voices? What solutions do people have that will help formulate this comprehensive and compassionate housing policy? We did rely on technical experts. Uh, we brought in um, about four different groups. The National Association of Latino Community Asset Builders, uh, LISC San Antonio, which you know, basically um, supports uh, the creation of affordable housing a group from uh, Denver that did a lot of the market analysis, um, economic planning systems, and also uh, Jimenez and Associates, uh, which helped with the community uh, facilitation and planning meetings that we held. Oh, I'm sorry. Quickly. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, history matters, and so we went back and took a look at the policies, both from the federal level, the state level, and the local level, that have influenced the development of San Antonio and the current sort of state of neighborhoods of housing, uh, and and so that was you know important for us because you can't develop policy without you know ignoring sort of the history of, of a community, and we were also very uh, keen and focused on understanding the impact that housing is having on vulnerable populations. Uh, vulnerable communities and for us I think in many ways we define that as individuals that were making less than 60% of AMI, individuals that need access to housing and support services uh, and so on. Uh, something very uh, key that we did early on, um, you know, and, and this again happens across the country, when people think about affordable housing they immediately think about public housing, or they think about those people, or they think about um, why are they in subsidized housing. And we thought it was important to really um, recalibrate and redefine affordable housing. And really affordable housing is the ability for everyone to be uh, able to not spend more than 30% of their income towards housing. Whether you are a teacher, whether you are receiving social security, 
whether you are a city employee, whether you are you know, working in a restaurant, the ability to not pay more than 30%, that is how the federal government defines affordability, uh, and that is um, how we uh, define affordability. Um, and the other thing that we thought was really important was to understand the economic situation of San Antonio uh, and understand the number of um, families that are um, struggling financially. So uh, there's a lot of sort of um, area median income data that was uh, gathered and collected. Another you know, key um, uh, piece of information that was really um, important in our development of our policy recommendations was looking at housing costs. Um, basically, over the last 20 years or so, housing costs have been increasing at a much faster rate than incomes. And, and so, you know, you see in this graph, um, in the last maybe 10 years, housing costs increased by about 5% per year, while uh, incomes increased by less than 2% per year. So what's the impact of that? The impact of that is that we have about 30% of households in San Antonio that are spending more than 30% of their income. And you know that equates to one out of five homeowners, uh, one out of two renters, 80% of households that are making less than 30%, I mean less than $30,000 a year. So when we talk about vulnerable populations, we have an issue with housing access, housing affordability, but we also have an issue with the amount of money that they're spending for that um, limited housing, and in some cases for that housing that is not in very good condition, that housing that may not be healthy housing, right, or housing that is um, really in need of repair or uh, in need of um, additional investment. I, if you can just go back. The, the other really important piece was also that 66% um, of all Latino households are cost burdened or spending more than 30% of their income. So again, vulnerable populations, who are they? Um, understanding how housing has a disproportional impact on certain communities more so than others. Um, the other really important piece of data or information that we gathered was that uh, housing production has not kept up with um, the, the growth of our city. In fact, we saw that uh, for the last 10 years or so, uh, we have been increasing the number of jobs uh, in San Antonio, maybe about 14,000 new jobs per year for the last 10 years but we have only been creating about 6,500 new housing units. So what happens, right? You're growing, but you're not producing enough housing. So either families will leave the city and look for housing that's affordable outside of the city, or they'll stay. They'll stay and they'll pay more uh, because you know, it's sort of a, kind of a supply and demand, right? You, you ha you're paying more because there's, lim uh, there's limited supply. This also impacts um, home ownership rates. Um, we also took a look at the impact that these uh, changes and the lack of housing is having in terms of our um, home ownership rate in San Antonio. And one you know, specific sort of factoid was that in the last 10 years or so, our home ownership rate has dropped from 61% uh, down to 54%. And so again, all of these factors create pressures in families, in neighborhoods. Uh, Marisol um, spoke about gentrification, displacement. So it's important to understand all of the things that are happening, right? Um, and to, um, to understand that it's not an individual problem, that we have a system problem. So um, as we move forward towards um, there are recommendations. This is a, a very short summary of uh, the recommendations. It's in a very high, high level, but these are basically the five areas that 
we recommend the city focus on, our city leadership focus on. Um, these five uh, areas of recommendation include about 11 specific um, policy implementation strategies, uh, along with you know 22 different steps. I'll just call on a, a few of them because I think it's important. Um, just as you know, we move into implementation, I think it's important for you all, all to be aware. I think our highest and number one priority, um, and I think Maria would agree, will agree with me, was um, ensuring that our city leadership, our community sort of um, under, basically the, the recognition, and this actually came from the people that were involved in this process, right, um, that we don't have a good way of coordinating and sharing information and really focusing on housing. That, it, that it's important for us to develop a system that is well coordinated. It's important for us you know, to have leadership at the city level. It's important for us to have the resources necessary to be able to coordinate uh, this housing system. And so our number one priority was the creation of a coordinated housing system. Um, a coordinated housing system that's not just about staff and programs, but a coordinated housing system that would lead to the development of a one-stop housing center where families that are looking for housing information or support uh, would have the opportunity and access you know, to, to go there. A coordinated housing system that would move um, the city of San Antonio from focusing on housing as a compliance issue to focusing uh, on housing as uh, an opportunity to innovate, uh, an opportunity to expand housing options. So this is our number one priority. Uh, we also recommended that the city hire a high-level housing executive to lead this effort, someone that um, really cares about housing, that is uh, collaborative, and that um, would become basically the face of housing and 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 basically the face of uh, the city, or, or more than the face, you know, that would provide the, the leadership necessary to make housing a priority. The other. Um, key um, recommendation that I'd like to focus on is this last one on ensuring accountability to the public. And this goes back to really the, the history of um, reports that have been maybe produced in the past that um, lead to a certain set of conclusions that don't get implemented. And they don't get implemented um, one, because either there is not sort of the implementation plan, which we did include in our uh, task force uh, report, or two, because there's not the political will and the governance structure necessary to make it happen. So under number five, uh, we've recommended uh, that the housing commission that was created a few years ago be reconstituted to focus on uh, the mayor's housing policy task force recommendations. We also recommended that uh, the city um, develop a process to keep residents informed about their progress implementing these recommendations uh, and that we also build in accountability measures to ensure really the intent um, of these, the, uh, to ensure that the implementation uh, was occurring um, in a manner which was respectful of the intent of those recommendations. You can, of course, read more about the recommendations by you know, getting a copy of the report. It's available online, and on page 12, we have a detailed list of all of the things that are included. I know, oh, page 11. Uh, I know several of you that are in the room also participated, and you know, we can't thank you enough for being part of that process. And then just, I'll leave you with this. Um, while the numbers may be fuzzy, uh, we, we would say, what we did see um, in the city was um, a commitment to increase funding. Uh, granted, some of these new dollars are dollars that are coming from the federal government because there was a bump in CDBG and home dollars. But some of these dollars were general fund dollars, which was a strong recommendation that we made, that the city began to increase its level of 
uh, investment and its level of resources. Uh, and, and also just kind of thinking ahead, we also recommended a change to the city's charter to allow the city to be able to um, put forward an affordable housing bond, similar to what Austin has done, similar to what many other cities have done to increase resources for affordable housing. So with that, I'll turn it back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, this. We have a situation here that we run out of time. However, I still have uh, people who need to go to another session. Please, you know, feel free to leave. Uh, you know, anybody? Do we think anything about it? Uh, however, uh, we do have other sessions. So uh, as you're walking out, um, I would like to uh, call our third person here. Uh, Jessica, I'm sorry, but we started late. But if some of you want to stick with us, we'll stick here. Right. There isn't another session in here. Huh? There isn't another session in here. Okay, well, she's going to hurry through hers. Yeah. I will, yes. Just really yeah, quickly, oh. I think. Um, oh, yeah. There's another session in here. Yeah. I'm gonna, well, she's going to close it oh, real fast. We're going gonna, to. We're gonna, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna, sorry, but we, we got delayed by the first session. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna, fast. We're going to close with where we started, right? The reason all of this has, has come to fruition. Um, there was another task force right after Mission Trails happened, and a subsequent housing commission was um, started then. Now there's this other um, task force that worked to another level, went a little bit deeper, and did actually, um, you know, hold the community perspectives with more um, higher regard and respect, and um, you know, recognize the, com the community for our knowledge and expertise in our own experiences. Um, and now, you know, as Lourdes said, that task force um, is uh, creating another housing um, commission to oversee the implementation of the recommendations. And the community, once again, is coming together to monitor that process and to make sure that that process continues to be informed by communities. So if you are interested in joining that group, there are some people that are already part of that. If uh, you are interested in maybe just learning more about that group, because we don't have time um, to go uh, too much into that, but um, the only other thing that I would mention is, um, you know, again, in different spaces, a lot of credit is given to um, the public officials that, you know, brought the political will to bring these groups together in this official capacity. And I always make sure that, we, that it is really clear that if Mission Trails, the residents of Mission Trails mobile home community had not raised their voice and insisted on raising their voice once they were ignored and ignored again and ignored after that, and even after that first task force was created, they did not reap any benefits from that initial um, effort. And now, and actually before Mission Trails, there was a smaller mobile home park further up the Mission Reach um, uh, area called Rolling Homes Mobile Homes Mobile Home Community that none of us even knew about. We didn't hear about it until afterwards. So we have no idea where those people went and what their what happened to them. Um, we are still in contact with a lot of people that lived at, Mo at a Mission Trails Mobile Home Community and understand that these impacts are ongoing. And um, unfortunately. We see also Soports in Town Center um, coming up again. And this group, these tenants, also spoke up, were ignored, and are also not going to reap the benefits that this task force process, this new task force process might bring about. So it comes down to us again to make sure that these five recommendation areas are implemented and really have the impact that we needed to have. So that you'll sign your name on there really quick and uh, lend us your phone number and email and we can we can let you know more about how we're trying to do that. I'm so sorry that we ran out of time, uh, but my concluding um, comments were that the, the three women who spoke uh, included an expansive part of the issue of housing. You know, uh, 
what I call the, the kind of thinking that we as humans were going to have to engage in and talk about, and those are the values that Marisol brought out. You know, it's not just housing, it's the way we live as humans and the way we live with the earth, and it's all one. Uh, what Lourdes talked about is we have to work in systems. We're a democracy, we're a representative democracy, we work. We have to have people like Lourdes inside uh, representing our, our interests, and, uh, and then people in the community who are able to garner the wisdom of the community, because without that, public policy is not good. So this is an example of the kind of leadership we want. And for me, I am delighted to say that in, in my future, uh, these women are going to be the leaders uh, in, in, in all that we have discussed today. And to tell Sati that she's gonna have to take it further than anybody uh, in her uh, studies and also as she finishes and becomes a, a professional that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you.